This morning's lesson is wisdom in generosity. Is there any wisdom to generosity? Isn't generosity simply pulling out your wallet, pull out a bill, and pass it on, and that's, that's it? I've given. I've been generous. Isn't that all there is to generosity? Should there be, should, is there anything else just be, besides pulling my wallet or giving my stuff or giving my time or giving my, my talents? Well, as we will learn this morning, there is far more than just giving in wisdom in generosity. Now, remember, when Paul wrote this, he was specifically writing to the church in Ephesus, to Timothy, who was the leader or the pastor in church in Ephesus, and he was teaching Timothy, his spiritual son, on how to manage and how to run the church. He began with the problems in the church, leaders who were in the church who were not supposed to be there. And then he gave a listing of the women uh, who were not supposed to dress up that way. And then he went to uh, uh, explaining that the, the, the work of the devil, the devil himself, will try to pull down every believer. So that you and I will become inefficient followers of the Lord. And so he goes on through that topic, and now he, he zeroes in to giving. And as we have read, as Lynn have just read this for us this morning, the main character to which things was given was to whom? A widow. So for some reason, this church has specialized in helping out the widows. So I would be giving you actually just three points as you have seen in your outline. And in this picture, you will have a idea of what the first point is. Anyone? What do you think? What does he show us? Some are clear, some are not, right? First point of your outline, a true wisdom in giving, in generosity, is that it is, what's the word? Selective. What's the word selective? Choosy. In other words, it identifies. It doesn't just give to the whole world, it gives specifically to a person to, or to a group of people or to a specific cause. What does that mean? Well, let's take a look. In your outline, in your text rather, verse 3 begins with, Give proper recognition to those who are really in need. Then another verse later on in verse 16, part B, it says, The church... Again, he was speaking to the whole church, can help those widows who are really in need. There are several words here that I would like to emphasize where we have derived our main point, which is smart giving, wisdom in generosity is selective. First words are the words help, give proper recognition. You know that word recognition, I've, I've looked out what that word means, and it means to give the right value. To the right people give proper recognition like in this group I could not just say to everyone happy birthday if no one is celebrating his birthday anyone celebrating today birthday oh there you go Yolanda's birthday happy birthday perfect perfect example we have one specific person whose birthday is today so would it be funny if I greeted every single one of you and say happy birthday of course it's wrong it's not right because only one person is celebrating in the same manner when paul said to timothy timothy there is plenty of need in ephesus and in anywhere else in the world but you need to be specific to whom you are giving generosity to he says give proper recognition in other words, identify who exactly are the people who needs it. And then it says, let not the church be burdened, but let the church help those who are really in need. Another word I would like to emphasize here is the word, what's the word? Widows. Now, what is a widow? No husband. No husband. That's the basic definition of a widow, no husband. But as we look deeper into this text, 
yes, it is true that in their sense, he was specific specifically to widows who don't have husbands. And why is that so? We need to understand their culture. You see, back then, ladies, you know, today ladies have the rights. We have the ladies' women's rights and all of those stuff. Back then, back then, in their culture, at that time, women are of no value. Men, as a matter of fact, has also become a problem in Corinthians where they simply wrote a letter of divorce and say, I want to change you. I don't like the way you cook. Let me find another woman. Let me find another wife. I mean, women are at the mercy of men. And so there were a lot of women who were basically divorced by their husbands, by their spouses, and they had become widows. Both divorces and both who actually, whose husbands have died. So, for some in this church in Ephesus, there were a lot of widows. And widows specifically are people who are not able to survive without the help of others. You see, it's far more than just losing a husband. Specifically, the widows here, which we'll get deeper into later, are women or people in general who are not able to survive on their own. That's why Paul later on says, in the same two texts, he said, these are not just widows, but widows who are really in need. You see, there are widows who are not in need when they lose their husbands. Not all widows who lose their husbands become lonely. Some of the widows, women who become widows, they start to become happy. <laughs> it's fun time. My husband is dead. <laughs> but no kidding. You see here, Paul made sure that the church in Ephesus wasn't just blanket offering help to every single woman who have lost their husbands. He said, you better watch and identify specifically those women who have not just lost their husbands, but women who could not survive on their own because they have lost their husbands. So what does it mean? To be a widow who cannot survive because they have lost their husband. Paul kind of gave a little definition of what it means. The widow who is really in need, here's how she looks like, Paul says. She is left all alone. That's one definition. She is by herself. No children, no relatives, no, but no friends, and she's left alone to survive, and what else? This widow is alone, and all she does is put her hope in God, hoping that God will use somebody to help her survive. That's, that's, that's no ordinary widow. I'm, I know people, ladies who have been widowed, but not many would categorize in this specific, specific kind of widows. And Paul says, Timothy, yes, it's true there are many widows in your, in your area, in Ephesus. But I want you to be selective of whom you are actually helping. Because there are many uh, advantage and disadvantage of simply just trying to help out everybody. There are some questions that I believe you and I need to ask if we are really selective of whom we are really trying to help. Questions like, do they need help? Do they really need help? Or am I just promoting laziness? You see, to be selective doesn't mean that you are putting down a certain group of people or certain individuals. Sometimes, helping is not helping. I repeat, sometimes helping is not helping. Did you hear me? Sometimes helping only promotes laziness. As a matter of fact, Paul mentioned later on, he says, young women, you're strong. Why don't you remarry? Why don't you work? Why don't you do something about your condition? Don't just depend on the church. Don't just depend on other people to help you. And church, don't just pull out your wallet and help the person because you're not helping them at all. 
I think I'm too loud. No? Okay, you like it loud? But I like to shout. So. Being selective really, in reality, giving is hard work. Because it's far easier, believe it or not, to pull out your wallet and pull a dollar and give it than to find out if the person really needs help. It requires more work. Questions such as, do they need help or they need a push? That's another thing. Some people who says, you know, they are, they really need help, all they need is a little kick to, to move on with responsibility. You know, it's sad, um, especially, you know, here in America, in the Philippines, I don't think we have this. Uh, food banks, and uh, what do you call that? Food distribution. And, I don't know, maybe two years ago or so, uh, Edna's sister, who works with one of the food banks and distribute food, uh, kind of said, oh, next time, why don't you come? You know, there's plenty of so myself, Okia, and actually my mom also went there. And we kind of lined up, and early in the morning, and the line was long. But one of the things I noticed, guess what? People that were lining up went to the place with an SUV. Man, dress up so well. Because there's no, there's no way of selecting. Simply come. And, and it, I'll tell you, it's sad because, because where we went is actually a church place. They were using a church facility to distribute and help people. But in many ways, it's not help. Probably it's not help. I really don't know until we identify and actually find out exactly what the people need. To be selective requires investigation. To be selective means scrutinizing. To be selective means to be responsible. Because giving out money and giving out help is not as easy as it looks like. And Paul was saying to Timothy, Timothy, you're a new church leader. You have elders in the church. You have deacons in the church. The, uh, you know, the people there are very faithful. They are giving. But it's sad that the church that you're pastoring is not, being very, is not becoming a very good steward as far as distribution of food. Remember in Acts 2 from so many weeks ago where we discussed about the Grecian Jews and the uh, uh, Hebraic Jews? And all of them are, are uh, widows. And there was fighting among these Grecian Jews and these uh, Hebraic Jews because distribution was not given fairly. You know that word fairly is greatly abused. Because we think the recipient of the help, we think that we need to receive help exactly as the other person. I read a book many years ago. It's called The One Minute Manager. How many of you read that? One Minute Manager. Oh, wonderful book. It's a, it's a very small book, but wonderful. But one of the things it, the, the author said, it is most unfair to treat unequal people equally. Okay, let me, let me put that into the right perspective. Myself, Okyang, Arela, and Joshua, oftentimes the kids will say, we want pizza. Okay, pizza. So we go. In a regular pizza, how many slices do you have? How many? Huh? Eight, right? One half? One fourth? Is that? One fourth? But anyway, there's eight. <laughs> eight. Now, here we go, the pizza's in the table, and there's four of us. What is fair? What is fair? To each? That's unfair! How can my little Joshua have exactly two with... I think his one pizza is far more than the two I eat. And how many of you think that is fair? There, I think I have one who agrees with me. You see, sometimes we, th we, we bring this word fair into the extreme, and we think that fair means equally divided. Here are widows. All of them were widows. 
but some widows were living in luxury. Some widows could hardly find where their next meal would come out from. And here's the church and says, here's one drumstick chicken for you and one drumstick chicken for you. That's unfair. No wonder even in our tithes and offerings, tithes in particular, the Lord did not say, every single one of you bring $300 each every month. Even the Lord did not say that. He said 10%, which makes it equal to everybody. It doesn't matter how much you earn. It's not a dollar figure. Okay, $100 each. No more, no less. Every single one. That's fair. No, that's not fair. And so Paul was saying to Timothy, Timothy, I think you're getting it wrong here. If you are going to apply wisdom in your giving as a church, which also apply as individuals, you need to be selective. Yesterday, myself and my brother, while well, uh, my sister and my mom, I believe, went to the grocery, we were just in the car, inside the car. And while we were in the car, in the parking lot, a guy knocked on the window. Opened the window, says, can I borrow a dollar? Question, would you give or not give? But you say, well, but, but I'm generous. I should, you see, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. What I'm saying is, it requires more than just pulling out a dollar. It requires finding out first a little bit more about the person. And not all people who knock on windows are people who are in need. Why do I know that? Well, you know, living in this church premises, and I stay in the office, and whew, at least once, twice every month, a bum would come in and knock and say, you need help. Now, how many of you think bums need help? Oh, of course, they push a cart. They need help. You know, they, they're, they dress are messy, they are smelly, and they need help. And so, you know, the thing about you know, this church, it's a wonderful church, we have all this food, right? There's all this food. Open the rock there, there's food. And uh, I think that was a Thursday, I believe. And by the way, the Wednesday Bible, this is a promotion for the Wednesday Bible study. If you guys want to eat, come on Wednesday morning. That's the secret. <laughs> uh, the class with uh, our brother Jim, Wednesday morning. So anyway, I, that's either Thursday morning or Wednesday afternoon when a guy knocked and of, I need help. I said, sure, why don't you sit for a moment? And off in the ref, there was leftovers there from sandwiches and so on. And I was about to give the person, and I said, no. I don't need food. I need money. I said, why? I just need money. To cut the story short, uh, since I've met several of the bums here, and some of them have become a little wiser and smarter, he said, for bums, food is not really an issue. There are many places where they can pick up food. Not all, but many want money to purchase alcohol. Not all, I'm not saying not all, but many. You see, so when we give, is it really being wise when we give that way? Or perhaps we are promoting something that we say we do not believe in. Be selective. So the real question is, should I help or not help? And if I should help, how will I help? And so Paul is trying to instill it in the mind of Timothy. Timothy, be selective. Next, what is this next picture? It is another S. Any guess? Chess. What, 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 do, you, what do you do with chess? Strategic. Strategy. Believe it or not, no church have a bottomless pocket. In other words, no church or individual is able to help you know, without limits. How many of you are that? You can help without limits. <laughs> There's one. But what I'm trying to say is, you know, you just keep on helping and helping until, you know, without a strategy. Let me tell you, even the Apostle Paul 
tells Timothy, Timothy, okay, now you have a group of ladies, women, who lost their husband and their widows, and, you are, and this group of people, you are to help them. But let me tell you a technique on how to filter. And if you take a look in verses uh, 9, he suggests to Timothy, Timothy, here's how you filter those widows who are really in need, and those people, or those ladies and widows whom you really need to help. He says, no widow may be put on the list of widows. Okay, sorry. Unless she is over 60. <laughs> so some of the ladies, oh yeah, I'm 61, right? Has been faithful to her husband. And then a few more hands went down. Uh, actually, a lot of hands went down. <laughs> and is well known for her good deeds. Fewer more, a few hands went down. Bringing up children in the right way. Showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. That's a lot of lists. It actually chopped down the list of widows of whom they were helping to a much smaller list. He continues, as for young widows, there were obviously plenty of young widows. He, he chopped them all off. Do not put them on such a list. For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Because they get into habit of, of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things they ought not to. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. So he first says, here's the strategy, Timothy. Let me suggest. First, not everyone in your list should be there. You need to chop off. First, age. Why age? Now, he did not explain here, but obviously, the younger you are, that means you're able to find some work, and in this case, find a spouse, because many of the women back then survived only through their spouses, through their husbands. So, Paul is suggesting, let them work. Don't promote laziness. Don't promote uh, what we call um, entitlement mentality. Uh, again, <laughs> I think this only happens in America. The entitlement programs, where people deserve this and deserve that because they've lost their job. I mean, America, for example, have bailed out a lot of companies who have made wrong decisions from being bankrupt and yet permitting other businesses to fail miserably. Why? I don't know if you've asked this question, but I've always been asking myself that question. Why bail out Bank of America and not Washington Mutual? Why? Because Bank of America is bigger? Maybe. But why Washington Mutual? Why permit them to die and be, be, be bought out? So. And the, and the entitlement. Because in America, if you're a big company, you're entitled for government fund. Individually, some of us are entitled. And sometimes we think, because I am this, I am entitled. Paul is saying, no, you're not entitled. If you are strong, work it out. So younger women, put them, do not put them on such a list. I already mentioned that. 13, besides, they get into habits of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also gossip and busybodies, saying things they ought not to. So as a strategy, these are really questions we need to ask ourselves. Because um, not only we need to identify the group of people we are to help, but within the group, who among within the group should we focus on and help? So what are the lessons we can say that Paul was trying to tell Timothy? He says to Timothy, Timothy, if you're going to be a wise giver, some of the things you need to learn is to learn how to say no. Say it with me, no. 
some people are having so much difficulty that when people ask them for help, they couldn't say no. They'd rather lie. Oh, I'll, ch I'll check first. Oh, you know, I'll go somewhere. I mean, you know, we have other reasons, but back in our minds, we really mean no. No is something that we can learn from our Father himself. Not all your prayer requests have been answered by the Lord. True or false? Many of them, our God says, no. If our God, who is the creator of all things, who is full of wisdom, can say no, how can't we say, you and I, no? Again, uh, if you ask, remember, he was talking to Timothy as the head pastor in the church. He was talking to the elders and deacons, and there were many needs in the church, both inside and outside the church. And one of the things Paul was trying to tell them, if you're going to be a wise giver, if you're going to be a good steward, you need to learn how to say no. Another word you need to learn how to say, not now. Say it with me. Timing is another issue. There are things where, yes, you need to help, but this is not the right time. Not now. Now, I know some of us will say, but you know, I, I'm a person who likes to give. Maybe you're having that problem. For, for those of us who are having no problem, say, no big deal, I can simply say no. <laughs> but that's other extreme. But in, in this case, for some reason, Timothy is not able to say no, he's not able to say not now. And so Paul is trying to say, tell him and teach him, you need to be strategic. How so? By learning to say no, saying not now. And another thing, if you're going to be a, uh, a good steward, a good pastor in the church, you need to be able to take opportunities for teaching. Look at me. Verse 14, it says, So I counsel. The word counsel means teach. You see, in every need, there is always an opportunity for learning. And so Paul was saying to Timothy, Timothy, if you're going to be use, using wisdom in the needs of the people in the church or out of the church, you need to be able to take these lessons and be able to teach the people and learn out of it. So counsel widows. Last but not least, he says, if you're going to be strategic, you need to see how the devil can work in the needs of people. He says here in verse 14, uh, counsel widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity. Sometimes we think that when we give, when we help, we are doing God's will. Not necessarily. Sometimes when we give, not in wisdom, we're only opening doors for Satan and his demon to work on that person. For example, let's say a person is a drunkard. And he comes to you and say, I need help. What would you do? Oh, I I'm generous. Here you go. What have we just done? We have just permitted the devil to work further in his life. There is a time to say, and there's a time to say, and there's a time to say, never. <laughs> you see, needs of people is an opportunity to be doing the work of God, but if not done in wisdom, can only open doors for Satan and demons to work further in the life of that person. So not all needs are equal. Not all widows are equal. So be strategic. Last but not least. Okay, so A, be selective. Second, be strategic. What's the third one? It is, giving is, spiritual. What are you thinking? Spiritual. You see, we think uh, giving and being kind to other people is simply acts of kindness. 
is simply becoming human. It, it's only what you know, uh, good people should be doing. No, no, no. It has further impact than just simply feeling good and being a good person or being a good citizen. Because giving in reality is a spiritual act of worship. Let's take a look. Verse 4. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, they should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family, etc. Verse 5. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God to pray and ask God. So, what are the few verses here? First, I'd like to point out that giving is really putting our religion into practice. Giving is, a, a, is an action that is birthed out because of our faith in God. Giving is not simply a, 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 a result of because I, was, I grew up this way. And some of us here, some of you here, are really givers. And oftentimes you say, how come you're a giver? Well, I I've learned this from when I was a little kid, to be a giver. Yes, it's true, it's nice. But in this case, especially as a church, they were giving because giving is supposed to be a result or a byproduct of their faith in God, of their religion. And it also says here that giving, what? Pleases God. And finally, those who don't give, this is the opposite. Those who don't give, what? Denied their faith. And is worse than an unbeliever. So you see, in one sense, Paul was saying to Timothy, Timothy, no, be cautious in the way you give. You need to be selective. You need to be smart. But at the same time, it says, you know what? Uh, some of you will say, wow, I had no problem with that because I don't give at all. Then Paul says, uh-uh, I'm talking to you now. Those of you who, who are not having problem in giving, because if you don't give, you are not exercising your Christianity. Because part of Christianity is equals to giving. Equals to, it's a spiritual act of worship. And I would like to share with you Ephesians 2, and many of us cling to this so strongly, and we say, you know, this is true, we need to promote this. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, many of you have memorized this, and the verse says, as far as salvation is concerned, for it is by grace you have been saved. So how are we saved? By grace. And what does grace mean? A gift, a undeserved good thing that has been given to us. So I am saved, I am a Christian, because it was given to me, and I don't deserve it. And so many of us cling to this. It is by grace I've been saved, through faith. And then more so, we continue a distance from yourselves. It is the gift of God. And then we again emphasize, verse 9. Not by works. Ha! Hallelujah! I don't have to do anything. I can go to church. When I die, I go to heaven. What can be better than that? And people say? <laughs> See, I don't have to boast. I don't have to show people I'm giving. But that's only one part of the equation. And this equation is very true. And if we're going to put a mathematical equation to this, this simply means this. That faith is the vehicle okay, to which we receive grace. And so that faith plus nothing else. No works, no good works, no, no being nice, no, nothing else can be added to our faith and that alone will give us salvation. That's a simple mathematical formula to say, you know what? I'm saved by grace, through faith, not by works. So I don't need to boast. I don't need to show off that I'm giving. But we are forgetting another part. Because many people misunderstood this. In the church back then, and I think it's also being misunderstood even for the church today. And so we say, you know what? There you go. I believe in God. 
I don't need to do anything else. I don't need to give. I don't have to worry about being selective, about being smart. I don't, I don't need to, I don't give. So it's no big deal for me, but you're forgetting this. James 2, 14 through 18. And Paul was, no, in this case, uh, James was the one writing, and he was uh, writing to the Hebraic Christians. And there were many Christians at the church where James was writing were taking their salvation for granted because I am saved. I'm saved by grace. I don't have to do anything. It's not by works. And so they just kind of you know, do their own thing. And here's what James said. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no? What's this? No works? Well, what good is it? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. Suppose a widow is among you and doesn't know where to survive and get his next meal. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? Is it James here was really challenging the way they think of what salvation is all about. He was challenging them of their uh, you know, idea of what Christianity is. Then he continues in verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Wow, what is, how, how could you choose a, a stronger word than that? It's dead, it's useless, it's nothing. It's only, you know, it's cheap. Because anyone can say he's a Christian. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. So we're just different. We're both Christians, but I have faith, you have deeds. And, and so James erases that idea and says, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. So in other words, although faith is invisible, you cannot see faith, per se, you know the word faith. Can you see faith? You cannot see faith. But that faith can be seen by the acts of the person who says have faith. So in reality, that equation we were earlier can be put up this way. Faith does nothing equals salvation. That's true. But what James is trying to say is this. He makes a little change to the equation. He says, true faith plus nothing equals salvation resulting in good works. Because true faith cannot be quiet. True believer in God, true Christian who says, I have been forgiven, understands that what the true meaning of grace and that grace should also be given to another. So you see, wisdom in giving is far more than just pulling out your wallet and giving, it's being selective. It's taking the extra work to find out exactly what the need of the person is. It is also strategic. He knows his limit. He knows to work with other people to be able to help the, the person in a better way. And finally, much, which is most important, true wisdom in giving is spiritual. It is a byproduct of true faith in God. True faith in God. So let me end at that. And the challenge for all of us is, do we give? And secondly, why do we give? Shall you all rise up, please? Let us pray. Can I invite everyone to have your heads bowed down, please? And let's just reflect on those, on the words of Paul and vice to Timothy. Though the situation is for a specific local church in Ephesus, the principle applies to individual giving as well. The church was challenged in Ephesus to give smartly and to give the right way and the right motive. The same is true for all of us as a church. I trust that the deacons that we do have 
the elders that we do have in this church are people who are uh, with wisdom. When we allocate our funds to expenses, whether we give it to the expense of this church building or to the expenses of the North Congregation or to which uh, missionaries to support, there are thousands of missionaries So among all of them. Should we just chop down $1 each or should we make it $300 each and have a fewer missionaries to support? It requires wisdom. And for the rest of the church, I do I ask you to pray always for the leadership of this church, that we are good stewards of the funds, the property that we do have, uh, the new place that we have in the north as well, and for the future things, material things that the Lord will give us. Individually, personally, the challenge for you and I is, first and foremost, do you give? Giving is part of Christianity. It cannot be separated. There are lots of widows around us. And those widows are not simply women who have lost their spouses. Widows represent people who need genuine help. Whether it be your money, whether it be your time, whether it be your talent, have you been giving? Do you see yourself as the, the same people of whom James was challenging? If you say you're okay with just having faith, then your faith is dead. That's James. I echo the same words. If you and I simply say, I'm a Christian because I go on Sunday and I go to church, that faith is dead. Doesn't benefit anyone. Doesn't even benefit you. It only gives open doors for the devil to work in your life and in the life of the people who needs help. Why don't you spend, let's all spend a minute or so, just talk to God. I don't know what they have spoken to you specifically in this area. Father, we thank you for your word for us this morning. Thank you for speaking to us through, through the letter of Paul to Timothy. Though it was a situation many, many years ago, that same thing, Lord, still happens today. May you find us as a local church, as a local body, with leaders appointed to be good managers not just the spiritual growth of people who attend church, but also for good management and good stewards of the material possessions you have given us. Individually, Lord, and as family, some of us have, have a misconception of generosity. Whether it be with our children, that we give everything they ask for, thinking that we are being a good parent. Not realizing that we have been opening their lives to abuse. We're opening their lives to materialism. Opening their young lives to have a mentality of, I deserve. Lord, you called your church to be responsible. You called your church to be using your wisdom to make decisions financially, materially. And I trust, Father, that your word this morning has spoken to each one of us in the different areas of our lives, and specifically in the way we give. To those of us, of us who are so generous, not thinking of how the money is spent, how the things we have given are, are used. Help us Lord, to, to learn to say no, not now. And for those of us Lord, who would hardly give for any reason, 
May you give us, Lord, the joy of giving. The joy of influencing the life of another for the good. And everyone say, Amen. Shall we all sing this song?